So 343 people applied for graduate entry medicine at Liverpool. They gave out 136 interviews and 47 of those people got in. The purpose of this video is to try and help you get one of those places. What are you telling me? My name is Marius and I am back down the end of the garden making these WAP graduate entry medicine videos. Got the tightest, the freshest trim, the 0.5 trim. And today we're going to talk about Liverpool graduate entry medicine, go through the entry requirements for Liverpool and then give you a few tips on the interview. Make sure you stick it through to the end because working through these interview questions might actually give you some ideas for other interviews. So the first thing we need to talk about is a level levels and degree requirements for Liverpool graduate medicine. So I plucked this off the website, actually in terms of GCSEs you need uh, maths and English language at grade C or four. In terms of A-levels, it just says that you need a couple two, three Bs and you have to have done chemistry. The remaining two can be made up of biology, physics or maths. You know, it can feel really off-putting and disheartening if you see that certain graduate medical schools have A-level requirements and you don't have those A-levels. It feels like such a task to go back and see if you can get those. However, I would just say that I know people that have done it, so it is, of course, possible. You just have to commit. Um, spend a few months revising and then just take the test and get a B. Um, so it is possible and people do it. So don't be too disheartened if you're in that position uh, and you really want to go to Liverpool. So what kind of degrees do they like at Liverpool Graduate Medicine? So this is something I plucked off a Freedom of Information request that someone submitted asking for the different degree types for the people they let to interview. So if you have a look down the left hand column, you can pretty much see that everyone has a BSc ONS. Um, you know, they're all kind of biological, biomedical type degrees. In terms of what class of degree you need, I think you need an upper second class honours degree. So a 2-1 in any of these biological, biomedical or health science subjects. Once again, these graduate medical schools use minimum requirements, so they're not going to favour people that have got firsts um, compared to people that have got two ones. Only very few medical schools actually preference people that have got firsts. For example, Bart's in the London. So my understanding of why they ask for these biomedical or health related degrees um, for the candidates applying to Liverpool Graduate Medicine is because of the nature of how they set up their course. I believe they do something similar to King's College London Graduate Medical School where they do kind of a summer school um, before you start. Liverpool it says that they do a two week summer school for the grads. So they bring you up to speed from the key points from year one and then you join the undergrads in year two of the standard program and then you just do two, three, four, five and that's your four year graduate medical degree. So effectively you've bypassed a whole year of medical school so they're expecting you to have some kind of biological, biomedical knowledge so that you're not floundering when they chuck you back in in year two. So the next thing we need to talk about is the entry test and Liverpool uses the GAMSAT. So on their website, Liverpool state the following cutoffs for the GAMSAT score. So in 2016, it was 55 overall with 50 in each component. In 2017, it was the same. And in 2018, it was slightly higher, 57 overall with 50 in each component. So you need to get at least 50 in each section, section one, two, and three, and you have to average kind of over 55. So if you average over 55, but one of your scores was 49, they're not gonna give you an offer clearly. So if we were to have a slightly more detailed look at this from a freedom of information request uh, from 2018. So this is how many people were interviewed in the three years, 2016, 17, and 18. It's all kind of around 140. However, I think let's focus on 2018 because it seems, you know, it's the most recent and it's the most relevant. So if we look at this list, it shows that 127 people were interviewed. So I did a quick head count and it shows that 50 people got offers out off the back of this interview and four of those were waitlisted. So essentially there's about a two in five chance that once you get to interview, then you will receive an offer. So I scoured column D of this spreadsheet to work out of the people that got offered places off the back of an interview, what was the minimum score? And it was this one here. It was 56 overall, so 53 in section one, which is the reasoning and humanities section, 57 in section two, which is the written communication section, and 56 in section three, which is your sciencey section. So once you've met all these criteria, you're going to be invited to an interview at Liverpool. So in previous years, Liverpool has interviewed their medical student candidates uh, in a multiple mini interview style. So basically you go into a room that's separated into six segments and these are the so-called stations and at each station they uh, assess a different characteristic that they like to see in their prospective medical students. So chatting to someone at Liverpool Graduate Medicine, it seems like they quite like their 
kind of classic -y med school interview questions. Um, so we'll run through a couple of them now. So one of the ones to have a little think about would be, should the NHS be privatized? So I think with any of these questions, you want to come across quite balanced. You know, you want to show them that you're a rational human being that can weigh up different sides of an argument and then essentially come to a conclusion at the end. So maybe you would say, you know, I can appreciate there's probably points on either side of this argument, so maybe I'll just try and outline a couple of those now, uh, and then I'll come to a decision at the end. If we start with one of the pros, there's this idea that privatizing the NHS um, would actually increase competition between trusts. You know, these private companies would be competing with each other for the attention of, you know, the consumer, you know, that person formerly known as our patient, because that's the only way these companies are gonna make a load of hard cash, you know what I'm saying? The idea is that if I'm a patient and I'm paying for my healthcare, then I am not going to go anywhere that has a dead healthcare service. I'm not gonna exchange my cash for that dead service. I'm just gonna go somewhere that's better. So inadvertently through this money grubbing means, services are gonna have to get really good at caring for patients. And that's the idea of that quality of care and standards of care are gonna go up if the NHS is privatized. So that's one argument for privatization. One argument against privatization is perhaps it seems kind of immoral to ask people to pay for this basic human need, you know, when they get sick. It seems somehow immoral to turn someone away that is suffering, you know, in pain or, you know, need some kind of support. So it might be life-saving support and turn them away just because they can't pay for it. Clearly this undermines one of the basic and core values of the NHS, which is that it's free at the point of care, it's based on clinical need and not the ability to pay. And then after you've said a couple of points for and against, then you might wanna say on balance, um, you know, whatever your opinion is, I believe that perhaps it shouldn't be privatized. We should keep it the way it is, although there's obvious flaws in it uh, and the fact that it's, under, it's severely underfunded, the NHS, I think on balance is something that we should be very proud of as a nation. It should probably be kept free at the point of care, but clearly some services are struggling because there's not enough funding. Um, so we need to get that right if we're gonna continue to have it in this way. All right, so one of the other bait kind of medical school questions is should euthanasia be legalized. So euthanasia is one form of this thing called assisted dying and assisted dying um, has lots of different types. There's the kind of withholding or withdrawing of treatment that happens now in the NHS, that's okay in certain circumstances. For example, taking someone off life support after a period of time because you don't think they're gonna recover. And then there's the thing called assisted suicide where you are just assisting or helping someone to commit the act themselves. And euthanasia is where the healthcare professional kind of plays an active role in the assisting of this person dying. So for example, they administer kind of a lethal injection or something like that. So there's certain differences and it's important to be aware of those little nuances and define the term that you're specifically addressing. So if they're talking about euthanasia, if they're talking about assisted dying, just know that assisted dying has a few different things within that category. Again, this is quite a thorny issue and it came up in a recent clinical ethics and law um, lecture we had. I listened to quite an interesting podcast with Henry Marsh, the British neurosurgeon, about his views on euthanasia. He's quite a big advocate for the legalization of um, this type of assisted dying. So again, regardless of your stance on this, it would probably be helpful in terms of answering a question in an interview to outline a few of the key points either side of the argument and then come to your conclusion at the end. So assisted dying or euthanasia might actually respect a couple of the key core guiding principles that we as healthcare professionals are supposed to be adhering to and those are that of autonomy and best interests. Autonomy is the idea that we should promote and encourage patients to make their own decisions about their healthcare and what they want um, to have done to them. Why then if a patient wishes to die and they have capacity to make that choice themselves, why then should we deny them that right to autonomy if we're, if we're adhering to that principle? Best interests is the idea that we as doctors should act in the well, best interests of a patient. And for example, if someone is terminally ill, they're in chronic pain, um, you know, they're doubly incontinent, for example, no, they can't control their bladder or their bowel, uh, and they're really suffering, and they're coming towards the end of their life, perhaps some would argue that it's in their best interests um, to just have a peaceful um, death instead of struggling on like that. That is not to say that everyone who is living in that situation um, does not have a life worth living. It's just personal preference. If someone does not feel that life, that life is worth living and that life does not have value, then 
should they have the option to um, legally be assisted in their dying in a peaceful way. That kind of brings to mind one of the other arguments in favour of legalising the process. Henry Marsh talks about in this podcast that he has a suicide kit and that he has kind of informal agreements with colleagues or, or ex-doctors that they will help him in his dying. He says that clearly he'd rather um, have this process done in, in like a medical and well-regulated environment rather than doing it at home with this weird suicide kit that he's got. So it's kind of the same argument that you hear around the debate about legalizing drugs. Like if you legalize drugs then you can guarantee the safety profile of those drugs and that will potentially cut out some of the shady stuff that goes on in the drug manufacturing process that ends up getting people uh, into trouble and in hospital. On the other side of this argument, some people say that actually, by definition, it cannot be in someone's best interest to die. These people might argue that any life, even if it's a life of suffering or, or pain or double incontinence, any life is better than no life. Another argument you might hear, which is like clearly a fallacy, um, is like, oh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a slippery slope that, you know, once you legalize that, it's gonna be, you know, everyone's gonna come, people are gonna be putting pressure on people to go and commit suicide um, via, at the hospital or whatever. And yeah, I think this is quite a classic Bobbinsy argument. It's actually called in like technical terms as the slippery slope fallacy. And that is basically where just with no evidence, you just start saying, oh, you know, if you're doing that, maybe that will happen down the line, this really extreme thing. And actually there's quite clear evidence to the contrary for this argument. So euthanasia has been legalized in the Netherlands for, for some years and somewhere else that I can't remember quite. Actually, they just haven't seen this kind of thing happening. So there's a couple of points for and against. Again, you'll want to conclude by saying on balance, although I've said this, this and this, um, actually my stance is this. The next thing that you might want to prepare for is that a really annoying question what differentiates you from others? So I put this question into Google just to see what would come up and actually the deadest answers <laughs> come up, I swear. So what differentiates me, man, is my skills and my ability to work on teams, uh, my commitment to teamwork. Um, you know, I can work with different personalities. Anyway, it's a load of bollocks. I think if I was interviewing candidates, I'd be quite put off if they started saying like, you know, I'm really driven, I'm compassionate, I'm good in teamwork. Like these are all the things that we want to hear, but you know, they're probably common to basically every medical student that's coming through the door. So you want to think of something that's a little bit more unique. And also it's a good opportunity to show them that you're interested in other things outside of medicine, which is very important because they don't want people that are just into medicine who are going to put everything into it and then burn out in this really long and arduous career. So for example, if you're very into reading fiction books, you can appreciate that lots of other people applying to this course are heavily scientific. And whilst you are also very interested in the science of human biology, you think reading books, fiction books give you that kind of personal insight into um, lots of different people's lives and their ways of living that you wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. For example, I read a book called Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. It is a hench book. It's probably 700 or 800 pages, something like that. It took me about 30 hours to read. But actually spending that length of time immersed in those characters' lives gives you such a mad insight into, yeah, in particular for this book, there were lots of very... Um, intense themes, abuse, um, self-harm, PTSD, etc, etc. So it gives you more of an understanding at least than you would have um, if, you, if you weren't spending that amount of time immersed in their lives. Then you might want to try and relate that back to uh, medical school and why that's useful. I think reading gives you different perspectives uh, which would encourage you to be compassionate and empathetic towards your patients. So there you go, that's something slightly bobbinsy but nevertheless rather deep. Um, I'll just leave you with this Dr. Zayas quote um, to aid in your kind of thinking about this question. You are you, that is truer than true. There is no one on earth that is youer than you. You know, like that, come on. The last thing it might be worth thinking about is some contemporary medical issues. For example, virtual medicine, the um, benefits and limitations of doing consultations online. So on the plus side, getting a consultation with a doctor over Microsoft Teams might actually speed up your access to that particular doctor you might not be waiting as long um, because they can just jump on a call with you and that's a good thing because we all know that waiting to see the doctor is like the worst thing ever on the other side of the argument I guess there's certain things about seeing your doctor in the flesh
mesh that are really important to the consultation itself. One of those things is that it might be trickier to actually pick up on non-verbal communication. They like to give this statistic that it's like, I don't know, 60% of the total um, act of communicating with someone and actually a minority of that communication is in the speaking of words. So I think perhaps doing the consultation online, you wouldn't be able to pick up on as many of those uh, non-verbal cues then actually you might miss certain signs. The other thing is that it's probably way more difficult to build a rapport with a patient. It's much easier if you're you're with them, you're looking them in the eye, and you can say how important it is to build that rapport with a patient. You know, having a trusting relationship between doctor and patient is fundamentally important to the treatment of disease. On balance, I'd probably say that there are pros to the, the online consultation and virtual medicine. Um, however, I think it should be used um, in certain limited circumstances and definitely shouldn't take over the in-person consultation thing. All right, so I hope that was reasonably useful. I am gonna drop an absolute bombshell right now, which is to say that as I was researching Liverpool Graduate Medicine, um, they have said that for 2022 entry, um, they've closed their program. I'm not exactly sure if they're gonna pick it back up the year after, so maybe these tips will become more relevant um, next year. I think the stuff on the interview process at least will be slightly transferable to other medical school interviews. Thank you for supporting the channel. We're almost at the double century, you know, like that. If you wanna connect, if you've got any questions, then follow me on Instagram and send me a DM. All right, I hope that was reasonably useful, and thank you very much for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.